Greetings and welcome to the Public Storage Fourth Quarter 2023 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If you'd like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star 0 on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Mr. Ryan Burke, Vice President of Investor Relations and Strategic Partnership for Public Storage. Thank you, Mr. Burke. You may begin. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our fourth quarter 2023 earnings call. I'm here with Joe Russell and Tom Boyle. Before we begin, we want to remind you that certain matters discussed during this call may constitute forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These forward-looking statements are subject to certain economic risks and uncertainties. All forward-looking statements speak only as of today, February 21, 2024, and we assume no obligation to update, revise, or supplement statements that become untrue because of subsequent events. A reconciliation to GAAP of the non-GAAP financial measures we provide on this call is included in our earnings release. You can find our press release, supplement report, SEC reports, and an audio replay of this conference call on our website, publicstorage.com. We do ask that you initially limit yourselves to two questions. Of course, if you have more, please feel free to jump back in queue. With that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for joining us today. Tom and I will walk you through our fourth quarter and full year 2023 performance, industry views, and 2024 outlook. Then we'll open it up for Q&A. 2023 was a year of significant achievement for public storage amidst a competitive industry environment. The team elevated our customer experience and financial profile through digital and operating model transformation, enhanced existing properties with over 500 solar installations and the Property of Tomorrow program, advanced complementary business lines including tenant reinsurance and third-party management, and grew the portfolio through acquisitions, development, and redevelopment. We did so while maintaining one of the real estate industry's best balance sheets, which is poised to fund growth moving forward in conjunction with significant retained cash flow. Just a few of our collective accomplishments include exceeding 3,000 owned properties and serving nearly 2 million in-place customers, achieving an approximately 80% stabilized direct NOI margin through revenue generation and expense efficiency that only public storage is capable of, acquiring and quickly integrating the $2.2 billion Simply Self Storage portfolio with approximately 90,000 customers across nearly 130 properties. This was the largest private acquisition in company history. Increasing the size of our high growth non-same store pool to 705 properties and 63 million square feet, now comprising nearly 30% of our overall portfolio. Generating record revenues, net operating income, and core funds from operations. Accelerating growth in third-party property management, adding 132 properties and reaching 324 properties in total. And receiving several accolades tied to sustainability, including NAREIT's Leader in the Light Award, a second consecutive Great Place to Work Award, and achieving top scoring benchmarks among U.S. self-storage REITs. The strength of our team, platform, and brand was evident with move-in volumes up an impressive 9% in 2023, despite a backdrop of weaker customer demand during the year. The new customer environment remains challenging, but we have seen a degree of improvement in move-in rent trends recently and our in-place customer base continues to perform well, with average lengths of stay that are longer than the historic norm. We expect demand from new customers to stabilize during 2024, and the behavior of existing customers, including our recent move-ins, to remain strong due to clearer macro conditions, including 
the potential for a soft landing, the potential for easing interest rates, resilient consumers, leveling home sales, and strong home renter behavior. We also anticipate fewer completions of new self-storage facilities nationally, reducing the competitive impact of new supply in our local markets. All in, the industry is in a better position entering 2024 than it was entering 2023. The full public storage team is focused on exercising our competitive advantages, which include advancing our digital and operating model transformation, expanding complementary businesses and creating partnerships across the broader industry, growing the portfolio through acquisitions, development, redevelopment, and third-party management, and funding innovation and growth today and into the future with the industry's best balance sheet. All of this adds to the growth of our business over the near, medium, and long term. And it comes at a time with the potential for further stabilization in the movement environment, existing customers exhibiting strong behavior, and an outlook for new competitive supply that is clearly in our favor. With good trends and customer demand, less pressure from new supply, and our numerous competitive advantages, we are well positioned for 2024 and beyond. Now I'll turn the call over to Tom. Thanks, Joe. On to financial performance. We finished the year reporting core FFO of $4.20 for the quarter and $16.89 for the year, ahead of the upper end of our guidance range, representing 1% growth over the fourth quarter of 22 and 8.3% growth for 2023 overall, excluding the impact of PSB. Looking at the same store portfolio, revenue increased 80 basis points compared to the fourth quarter of 22 at the higher end of our expectation. That was driven by better move-in volume and move-in rate performance. On expenses, same store cost of operations were up 5.1% for the fourth quarter, largely driven by increases in marketing spend to support that move-in activity. In total, net operating income for the same store pool of stabilized properties declined 50 basis points in the quarter. Meanwhile, the non-same store NOI grew 31% and 25% for the fourth quarter and 23 respectively, demonstrating the continued strength of our lease-up and non-stabilized assets. Now turning to the outlook for 24. We introduced 2024 core FFO guidance with a $16.90 midpoint on par with 2023. As Joe mentioned, we enter the year more encouraged than we were last year at this time. We've seen the industry work through the declines in new customer demand from the peaks of 2021. We're anticipating that new customer demand stabilizes in 2024 as the macroeconomic picture becomes clearer. That paired with a consistently strong consumer and lower new competitive new supply. If we look at the same store outlook for 24 specifically, the midpoint calls for revenue on par with 23. Similar to last year, move-in rates continue to be the biggest variable in the forecast heading through 2024 as well. We're anticipating at the midpoint case that move-in rents lap easier comps through the year and cross zero on a year-over-year -year basis towards the end of the summer. And occupancy uh, results down 80 basis points, which is roughly on top of 2019 occupancies as we sit here today. Our expectations are for two and three quarters same store expense growth driven primarily by property tax and marketing expense. That leads to same store NOI growth at the midpoint of a decline of 90 basis points. Our non same store acquisition and development properties are poised to be a strong contributor again in 2024, growing from 370 million of NOI contribution in 23 to 505 million at the midpoint and will grow from there in future years. In addition, embedded in the outlook is incremental acquisition and development activity, 500 million of acquisitions, and we plan to deliver a record 450 million of development in 24. Finally, our capital and liquidity position remains solid. 
our leverage of 3.9 times net debt and preferred to EBITDA, combined with nearly $400 million of cash on hand at quarter end, puts us in a very strong position heading into 2024. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Rob. Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please limit to one question and one follow-up. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question comes from Steve Sakwa with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thanks, <clears throat> and good afternoon. <clears throat> good morning. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, Tom, if you could talk a little bit about the ECRIs that <clears throat> are maybe embedded in the high and low end of growth and how those maybe compare to the ECRIs that you achieved in 23? Sure. Ha happy to add that color, Steve. I think. It as, as you know, I, I like to speak about existing customer rent increases as a combination of customer price sensitivity as well as the cost to replace that customer if they vacate upon receiving a rental rate increase. And as we look at 2024, there's a couple of, of things at play here. One is as we enter the year, right, demand is a little weaker. We'll give you a January, February update here, here shortly where uh, move-in rents are down year over year as we start the year, similar to how we finished in 2023. That's going to lead to higher replacement costs through the first part of this year. That's going to be a little bit of a drag to ECRI performance. The flip side is Joe spoke to the strength in move-in volumes that we experienced through 23. Those new customers are going to be eligible for rental rate increases, which will lead to more contribution from the volume of increases that are sent this year, such that at the midpoint case, uh, we're looking at contribution overall uh, pretty consistent with 2023 with those two uh, pieces offsetting each other. In the high-end case and low-end case, a, a little bit better uh, price sensitivity in the high-end and a little bit worse in the low-end. Great, thanks. And then on the expense growth, can you maybe just talk about what's embedded for marketing and, and sort of how you're thinking about that? I guess we were a little surprised that expense growth overall was coming in, you know, kind of at 275 at the midpoint, but just what do you have baked in for marketing, just given the still somewhat challenging uh, demand environment? Yeah, so as I noted in, in my prepared remarks, that the key drivers of expense growth are property taxes and marketing. So I will note property taxes are largest expense line item. We do anticipate to be up 4% plus or minus, which is a, a contributor. And then on marketing expense, taking a step back, we increased marketing spend through the year in 2023 uh, and saw very good returns associated with that. The fourth quarter, uh, our marketing expense as a percentage of revenue was 2.5%. And as you've heard from me in the past, uh, being in that uh, 1 to 3%, 1% 1 back in 2021 when demand was really, really strong, and back towards 3% when you go to a more typical operating environment pre pandemic, um, it is a comfortable place for us to be. Uh, and so the first part of 2024, we're going to be lapping comps uh, that will lead to year-over-year -year growth levels that are higher, similar to what we experienced in the fourth quarter. Uh, and then we'll uh, evaluate as, as we go from there. But we're comfortable in the zip code and continue to see a very strong return uh, on that advertising dollar. Great, thanks. Our next question is from Michael Goldsmith with UBS. Please proceed with your question. Thank you a lot for taking my question. Uh, you, you finished the year with uh, 80 basis points of same store revenue growth, and your guidance for the upcoming year ranges from down one to up one. So um, presumably same store revenue growth is going to dip before it kind of rebounds, and that, that goes in line with, the, I think, some of what you've been saying with the with your expectations of street rate. So 
Yeah. How much? How much of a in, in your mid, the midpoint of your guidance? How much of a dip are you expecting, and and when are you expecting trends to kind of inflect better through the year? Yeah, good question, Michael. So there's a couple components to this question that I'll, I'll respond to. The first is, as we look at our operating metrics, uh, our operating metrics are starting to improve. Right? We we talked about. Uh, Occupancy closing the gap as we move through last year and we finished the year with occupancy down 70 basis points compared to down 240 basis points when we started 23. If you look at move-in rent trends, um, move-in rents uh, on a year-over-year -year basis uh, decelerated through the year. Uh, in the fourth quarter, they were down 18%. Uh, throughout the quarter, but as we noted in our January update, they improved to down 11%. Um, in December, looking at January and February, they're down in that same 10, 11% sort of zip code. So that, that improvement uh, has been lasting. And as you heard through our outlook, we anticipate that to continue to close as we move through this year. I highlight that because operating metrics tend to lead financial metrics, meaning that as we're talking about some of these operating metrics improve, it will take several quarters to see that in financial metrics. And so you think about the shape of the curve and the, the description of the midpoint case that I gave earlier, uh, it would imply that, uh, to your point, we're going to see some deceleration through the first couple quarters of this year. But then the second derivative, the, the rate of change of growth, is going to flip positive in that midpoint case in the second half. And you're going to see some reacceleration in the financial metrics, again, lagging those operating metrics, in the second half. The, the, the second component of the question that I just highlight is we're already seeing that in certain markets. And so if you look at the Mid-Atlantic, for instance, or Seattle, markets that maybe didn't have the high highs in 2021 uh, but have been solid performers, uh, we're actually seeing those uh, accelerate as we sit here today in the first quarter. Uh, and would expect those high, high markets, you know, the Floridas, uh, the Atlantas, for instance, to take a little bit longer to find that turn given how high their high was. Uh, but we're, we're already seeing some of that, um, that turnaround in, in some of our operating metrics today. Thanks for that. And, and my second question, it's a multi-parter, but it shouldn't be too intimidating. Um, you comment in, in the SUP that you say you expect industry-wide demand from new customers to stabilize this year due to improving macroeconomic conditions. So one, are you, are you seeing that today? Two, can you kind of provide an update on where the move in rents were in January and, and, and to the extent that you're able to provide insight into February? And then three, you know, the, um, you know, you've talked about move-in rents crossing the zero. Um, you know, how positive, you know, if that momentum has continued, how positive could move-in rents be as we kind of exit the year? Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, apology accepted. But, yeah, you, 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 took, you took some liberty there, Michael, but we'll, we'll address your question. <laughs> All right. So let me start with uh, consumer um, strength. And what we continue to see in the portfolio that's been trending, you know, to a clear advantage, um, even with um, the performance we saw quarter by quarter in 2023, you know, the consumer activity, um, first of all, in existing customers, as I've mentioned, has um, been quite strong, and we're really not seeing any, you know, on the margin evidence that that's likely to change, um, even going into what we've seen through almost two months of this year. Balance sheets are quite healthy. Payment patterns um, are still better than they were pre-pandemic. We're not seeing any undue or new stress evolving into customer um, activity. Um, the acceptance of our ongoing revenue management tied to existing customer rate increases. Uh, we have a very active engagement process with existing customers um, that guides us to, to the tolerance and the level of activity that we're pushing through on ECRIs. That too has not um, hit different levels of um, either areas that we've become more concerned about. In fact, it's validating many of the things that we've already talked about 
relative to the performance of existing customers and our confidence that that's likely to stay with us, even coupled with what Tom just mentioned, uh, indicating in certain markets we're even actually seeing to see you know, some good um, percolation taking place. That ties clearly to the kind of activity from a new customer demand activity. Um, we're having to work harder, um, as we did all through 2023, with the variety of tools that we have. They're quite good. In fact, they continue to get much better. Uh, we are very confident market to market with our scale and the knowledge we have market to market. We have the right tools. We have the right brand. We have the right technologies to continue to pull customers to our platform, and we're going to continue to leverage, leverage those going into um, you know, the next several months uh, with the anticipation, as Tom mentioned, that um, you know, by you know, summer, late summer, we're going to start seeing the residual effects to the positive um, from all those efforts. Um, and then, Tom, you can tackle, if you choose to, Michael's additional <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, Michael, I'll just maybe take a step back and, and, and talk a little bit about how we thought about the macro environment in our guidance. So last year on this call, uh, we spent a good bit of time talking about the macro environment, and we did couch the guidance range last year uh, in macro terms, and that we viewed as appropriate given the landscape at the time. At the time, 65% of Bloomberg economists were expecting a recession during the calendar year, uh, for instance, and we thought it would make sense to provide the investment community uh, our assumptions of what that could potentially look like within our guidance range. Uh, clearly, as we moved through 23, uh, that recession outcome became less probable, uh, and, and as such, our financial performance uh, proved out to be towards the higher end of those uh, expectations as we moved through the year. This year, we are not couching the range uh, in terms of macro. Uh, and as you think about the midpoint of the range, we're not assuming that the macro environment needs to improve uh, at the midpoint range, but more around the lines of what Joe was speaking to and what we're seeing today. Um, so I ho hope that's helpful in terms of how we've thought about the range. And then I will uh, hit on one of your comments just again, because you, you asked about what move-in rents were doing in January and February. I'll just reiterate that for the group. Move-in rents were down 10 11%, so pretty consistent with, uh, with December performance, which is what you'd anticipate, right, because we're at, at kind of the trough of rental rates uh, in the winter season here, uh, and we'll be looking to March, April, and May to see some acceleration in move-in rents. Thank you very much. Good luck in 2024. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Our next question is from Juan Sanabria with BMO Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. Um, maybe just piggybacking off of a part of Michael's question. Uh, I, I guess what is assumed within the range of when uh, street rates break that year-over-year -year break-even point and, and if you have any color around uh, changes in, or differences in occupancy assumptions at the higher low end of the range? Sure, Juan. I'll give you some context around both the high and the low. And, and specifically, uh, you're speaking to same-store revenue, so that's where I'll focus my uh, attention. So as I noted, at the midpoint case, that assumes that we cross that zero on a year-over-year -year basis for move-in rents uh, at the end of the summer, uh, and occupancy being down about 80 basis points, uh, pretty similar to where we, we finished the year in 23. Uh, and I would note that that's, as we sit here today, year to date, we're down 70, 80 basis points in occupancy, so consistent with where we sit today. In terms of the high end and the low end, the low end uh, assumes that it takes a little bit longer uh, for operating metrics to stabilize here. And as such, um, the assumption on when we cross zero on year-over-year move-in rents is at the end of the year. And uh, in that case, we're assuming right, uh, uh, it takes a little longer to stabilize. Uh, the move-in environment is going to be a little bit tougher. Occupancy is down about 120 basis points year over year. At the high end, we're assuming a, a more vibrant spring leasing season, uh, one which we see a little bit of a rebound in the housing market, something we spent a good bit of time talking about through the, the fall of last year. 
there are some indications that we, we could experience that this year. The high end of the range assumes that, and as such, that uh, zero crossing point is at the beginning of the summer in that spring leasing season. And uh, occupancy, as you'd expect, uh, results in uh, better performance down about 20% or 20 basis points, sorry, 20 basis points uh, throughout the year with an acceleration in the summer and a, and a higher peak uh, seasonally. Thanks. And then uh, for my follow up, you're assuming acquisitions in the guidance. So just curious if you could speak to the investment environment. Um, any color on where you see stabilized cap rates and just the quality and, and the, the quantum of, of opportunities out in the marketplace? Uh, yeah, sure, Juan, I'll take that. I would say at this point, we're continuing to see the same environment that we saw through most of 2023. So a lot of um, owners are reluctant to put properties into the market knowing that they're going to um, potentially not achieve the cap rate or the valuation that they expected based on prior year um, inflated um, valuations, et cetera, when interest rates were at a much different price point. So the reluctance um, continues. Um, the amount of activity you know, going into the first part of this year, which is typically very light, is just that. Um, we are getting a number of inbound discussions that are tied to properties that are quote unquote not on the market to either test the water or judge whether or not um, we are ready to transact at a valuation that um, either meets or would be acceptable for that particular seller. Um, we do not have anything um, as noted in our um, release um, currently under contract. Um, the team's busy. Um, we're engaged in a number of different conversations with a variety of different um, size opportunities, whether um, single assets or um, larger portfolios. But as you know, we saw in 2023, you know, the beginning of 2024 is likely to be very similar, and um, we'll see. You know, going into you know the next few months, if there's either some pent up demand or uh, additional realization that uh, um, cap rates have adjusted, and we'll just see if, in fact, um, there's going to be more trading. Um, clearly, one thing that could moderate that to some degree and push activity to a higher level is, um, you know, some, you know, activity by the Fed reducing interest rates potentially, you know, with some impact on um, cap rate adjustments, et cetera. But frankly, there's just not a lot of trading going on right now to give you any really clear sense of how directly cap rates have changed of the moment. But the gap continues, meaning the um, level of seller expectations to what we feel are prudent ways for us to allocate capital. Um, many of the conversations just start with that, and uh, we'll see how that plays out here in the near term. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeff Spector with Bank of America. Please proceed with your question. Great, thank you. Um, just trying to, you know, think about all the comments, uh, upper end, the lower end assumptions, skepticism we continue to hear, just some of the concerns. I mean, I guess to be clear, are you saying from the data you're seeing year to date that you finally feel there is more or greater visibility on how to forecast this year versus, let's say, last year? Yeah, Jeff, I think as, as we sit here today, we do have more visibility, we think, heading into this year. I mean, we, I just spoke earlier around uh, how we couched the ranges last year and the macroeconomic environment. Our view is the macroeconomic environment is clearer this year. We're not couching the ranges that way. And as we sit here today, right, it's very different than last year. Last year, we knew that demand was, was weaker and we were going to see uh, revenue growth decelerate through the year in a pretty meaningful way. Uh, this year, that pace of deceleration has really slowed. And as I highlighted earlier, there's actually some markets in our portfolio that are reaccelerating already in the first quarter, uh, which we view as leading as we move through the year. Um, and so from a, a, a range of 
of variability less than last year. Now, that's not to diminish the fact that we're still in an uncertain environment. We're still talking about move-in rents being down 10 11% to start the year. That's not like a typical pre-pandemic year where we'd be debating, are move-in rents going to be up 3% or are they going to be up 5%? Uh, in a very tight band. That's that's not the environment we've been operating through in the last several years, and and as such, we think we've we've couched the ranges uh, appropriately to encapsulate that um, that variability. Uh, but we we do feel more confident in the range of outcomes this year than we did last year. And you know, like many times, Jeff, it's never one single issue. But Tom, you know, just went through a number of the things that. It, have you know given us more uh, clarity and perspective going into this year that we think are a additive one by one. Uh, another factor that's continuing to trend very favorably to the entire industry that we're seeing, particularly um, in nearly every market we operate in, are reduced levels of deliveries. Um, the development business has continued to be very, very difficult. Um, funding for new construction um, is either at a very high cost or from an availability standpoint, very limited. Um, the time to get through entitlements, even for our own processes, are um, continuing to be very difficult. So this too creates another additive element that we have even more perspective on now that we've been through a multi-year deceleration of new development deliveries, um, putting us in a very different position even year by year that we have more confidence to say this is um, you know, a different environment, very different than where we, we, we were even a year ago. So uh, with that, we think that we've got the right perspective, um, continue to read the variety of tea leaves out there, but we are very confident that we've got the right tools to guide us and you know, put the kind of perspective that we've got into our um, outlook for 2024. Great, thank you. And then my follow-up is, uh, can you discuss uh, trends you're seeing in, in January and February, including move-in, move-outs, and and maybe, you know, which markets are, are doing better or worse, let's say, year-to-date? Thank you. Uh, sure, Jeff. I mean, I think I've already covered the move-in rate component, uh, and as well as the occupancy side, so maybe I'll just focus on the market uh, part of the question, which is, uh, not too dissimilar to fourth quarter performance. We continue to see strength in Southern California, for instance, uh, as our strongest area of growth. And uh, as we spoke about through 23, the the markets that had the highest highs in, in 21 and 22 uh, are giving back some of that uh, appropriately so. And so the, the weaker markets on a growth rate basis to start the year are some of those southeastern markets, Florida, Atlanta, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Our next question comes from Keegan Carl with Wolf Research. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks for the time, guys. Um, maybe first, just you know, where's your development line or development pipeline start for the year, and where are you expecting to end based on your anticipated deliveries in twenty four? Yeah, Keegan, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about the development environment and and then some of the sequencing of our deliveries. So if you, you know, as we've uh, sat here today, we've been trying to grow our development uh, business uh, from where we were delivering more like 100 to 200 million in, de in deliveries in 21 and, and 22. Last year, uh, we delivered 360 million, as I noted in my remarks. Uh, we're looking to deliver 450 this year, so an acceleration when the industry overall is seeing uh, deliveries slow down. So we're, we're taking some share there and growing that business. And we're doing so because we think it's the highest risk-adjusted return on capital. And you can see the returns that we've achieved on our development vintages in the SUP. Uh, and we have yeah, an in-house team that's dedicated to this program, um, development, construction, design, uh, that are all out uh, working on growing that pipeline. Uh, this will be a record year. Uh, the team is out uh, figuring out how we're going to backfill that development pipeline from here uh, in a challenging development environment. Uh, but as we sit here today, that's a business we want to grow. Um, and, and we'll be looking to backfill that pipeline uh, and have deliveries next year, you know, hopefully around the same levels that we have uh, this year uh, and go from there. And, yeah, just 
from a timing standpoint, Keegan, um, you know, a little lighter in Q1, uh, but then pretty balanced deliveries in the subsequent three quarters, a little bit differently than what we saw in 2023, where we had a lot of deliveries hit um, more towards the second half of the year. So we've got a good combination of both ground up new development and um, we're a little overweighted on expansion and redevelopment opportunities, particularly tied to, you know, two um, unusually large projects that we'll complete in 2024. So um, as Tom mentioned, you know, teams working hard, not only to continue to grow the overall pipeline, but uh, to continue to put, you know, these generation five, you know, class A properties into a whole variety of markets. And, uh, we'll continue to see very good lease up and, um, you know, again, returns tied to the development activity, both new development and redevelopment. Got it. That's really helpful. And then shifting gears here, I, I know Tom mentioned a little bit about SoCal demand. I'm just curious, have you seen a material change uh, for storage demand in L.A. on the back of the flooding? And then can you just remind us of what the typical tailwind of a natural disaster is for demand in the given market? Sure. So I, w I wouldn't call the rains that we've had in the winter here in Southern California a natural disaster. Um, it, it's been raining this week, frankly. Um, so we don't see a surge in demand. In fact, what we tend to see is Southern California uh, residents and drivers tend to, to stay off the roads and you don't see as much move-in activity or move-out activity, for instance, in um, in periods of time when it's it's raining here in SoCal, but overall, uh, I'd say demand remains healthy here. Um, occupancies are, are very healthy in in LA, uh, San Diego, Orange County. Uh, so we feel very good about how the portfolio is set up, and and we'll work through the rains here uh, in SoCal. Great, thanks. For it's uh, sun shining today, so uh, it'll be a busier day today. <laughs> Our next question comes from Spencer Alloway with Green Street Advisors. Please proceed with your question. Thank you. Um, maybe just a more pointed question on the transaction market. And I, I know it's a small uh, sample set here, but the 11 assets you closed in the fourth quarter, can you share the going in yield and then where you expect uh, that to stabilize? Uh, sh sure. Getting in, into specifics, I'd say the um, – you know, there's a range of going in yields depending on how stabilized the assets are. So uh, of those 11 assets, some of them uh, were, were CFO properties where, you know, the going in yield is zero or a little bit negative. Uh, and then you, you had some that were more stabilized that going in yields are probably mid five to 6%. Uh, and we're going to uh, seek to improve the operations on those portfolios and get them to, or those, those assets rather, and get them to 6% plus. Uh, as we think about the return profile of those assets. Uh, and that, that's pretty consistent with uh, what we saw through most of 2023. As Joe mentioned, we'll see how the interest rate and capital environment plays through um, uh, into 24, but that uh, hopefully gives you a guidepost on, on yields. And, yeah, Spencer, from a strategy and appetite standpoint, we continue to um, look for properties that, are um, potentially um, either lease up opportunities or stabilization opportunities, you know, by putting those assets on our own platform. So not shy at all about, you know, taking on lease up risk. In fact, you know, many times, you know, we see a actual, you know, pretty sharp improvement once we put those assets onto our own platform. And we're confident that, again, those um, strategies will play well, you know, even going into this year and continue to look for a whole range of different uh, type of assets, even based on age and uh, maturity of the tenant base, et cetera. But uh, clearly no differentiation relative to the strategy we've deployed over the last few years, looking for uh, opportunities when properties are far from stabilized. And again, buying the properties at the right price point, location, et cetera, continues to be very advantageous for us. Okay, great. And, and to that point, in regards to the Simply portfolio, can you provide an update on where the rent and occupancy uh, stands today for those properties relative to, um, you know, the same store pool? Sure. Uh, so the, the, the rents of that uh, portfolio uh, have, have 
been improving as they've been added into our uh, portfolio. So we've already seen some of the benefits of, of adding that portfolio in. The occupancy as it sits there, I think is in the, the mid 80s uh, today seasonally. I think when we took it over in the peak of the summer, it was towards the upper 80s. Um, we'll obviously look to lease that back up uh, into the spring leasing season and, and take the occupancy of there ultimately into the 90s on stabilization. Uh, so seeing good trends as we've added that uh, portfolio and those 90,000 customers into our, our uh, um, portfolio and um, on track for a good um, spring leasing season with that portfolio with properties orange painted and uh, public storage signage, which um, uh, the customers are uh, reacting well to. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Todd Thomas with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please proceed with your question. Hi guys, this is AJ on for Todd. I appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, just first one, as you've noted, um, you've made good progress on narrowing the occupancy gap year over year over the past few quarters, I guess. Um, why, why would you not expect to call back more occupancy throughout the year, given the easier comps and the broader stabilization that you're anticipating in your base case around move-in rents and demand? Yeah, I think uh, part of what, what you're seeing in that midpoint case is if you take a step back, right, we had really strong demands and occupancies in 21, 22, and as those tenants cycled through uh, and we experienced weaker demand through 23, uh, we're seeking to maximize revenue ultimately in a trade-off between rents and, and occupancies, and that's managed at a very granular level, uh, you know, at the unit uh, level across our properties uh, based on the demand we're seeing, the customer price sensitivity, et cetera. And, and so that, that balance is, is real at the granular level. And what you see at the output is uh, it made sense to, to give up, in effect, some of that um, 2021 heightened level of occupancy uh, to maximize revenues. And as we sit here today, our occupancies are down about uh, 70, 80 basis points compared to where we started 2023. Again, that midpoint case doesn't assume that there's uh, a big uplift in seasonal demand. Uh, and so you're, you're kind of, um, you're not getting a, a big lift there, similar to how we experienced last year. And so, you know, as we move through the year, you may see some closing towards the end of the year, but uh, you're going to probably finish on average through the year about the same as where we're sitting today. Okay, that's helpful. And then just on the seasonality, um, you know, you had software seasonality last year. Uh, what's embedded in the guidance for 2024? And I guess really looking at historical data, um, when do you expect to start seeing the pickup in rental demand for the peak rental season? Sure. So this, I'll couch seasonality in terms of the peak to trough change in occupancy. So uh, last year uh, we experienced, or I could taking a step back even further, in 2015 to 2019, there was typically about a 280 basis point peak to trough change in occupancy. Call that from June 30th to December 31st. Uh, in 2022, we experienced about a 240 basis point. So it was a little bit uh, less seasonal than, than a typical year. In 2023, that fell all the way down to about 160 basis points uh, peak to trough. And in 2024, our midpoint case is a, a touch over 200. So a little bit more seasonality, uh, but not as much as we experienced in 22 in a, a far cry from what we experienced in uh, in the pre-pandemic time period. Great. I, I appreciate the color. Thank you. Great. Thanks. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. One moment while we poll for questions. Our next question comes from Eric Wolf with City. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thanks. You talked about the moving rents uh, crossing over into positive territory in late summer. Um, just curious where moving rents will be at that time. So what's the annual contract rate that you expect to see in late summer, and how much of that improvement uh, from current levels is just driven by seasonality versus a, a strengthening of your business? Um, thanks, Eric. So I think 
Um, we'll have to dig up and we can get to you exact. I don't have in front of me what our third quarter uh, move in rents were, uh, for instance. But at end of summer, uh, we're expecting to cross zero. So I'd, I'd look at plus or minus our third quarter of 23 move in rents. And I think the team's going to dig up third quarter uh, contract rents so you, you can have them. Um, in terms of what we need to see to get there, there's there's seasonality every year. So as the question earlier, so even in a year last year where I'd call it a, a, an atypical year where we didn't see a lot of seasonal strength through your April, Mays, and Junes, uh, the housing market has um, been very well publicized as uh, uh, resetting lower in terms of transaction volumes as being a driver there. Um, as we think about move-in rents, uh, they're going to rise, and they rose last year, they're going to rise on an absolute basis into the summer. And then what you're going to uh, see is a, a little bit more growth in rental rates this year to close that gap over the time between now and the end of um, uh, the year last year, or the end of um, uh, the summer uh, this upcoming year. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I guess the question then really is just, you, you talked about that extra gap that it needs to sort of close um, to get there and be above and beyond seasonality. Can you just put that in context? Like, is that a is that extra gap that it needs to close pretty large relative to history? Is it somewhat normal relative to other recovery periods? Just trying to understand sort of, you know, whether it's unusual relative to, to what you've seen in the past. Yeah, I guess the way I'd characterize it is we saw less than what we would typically see last year in terms of a seasonal uplift in rents. And and what we're saying is we're expecting stabilization in demand through this year, which means that we shouldn't continue to set new lows uh, seasonally adjusted on moving rents um, in the midpoint case. And, and so that's going to result in closing of that gap, we're not suggesting that the environment needs to get significantly better, but rather stabilize as we move through this year and not set fresh lows. And to follow up on your question, the team dug it up. We had uh, move-in rents on a contract basis in the third quarter, about $16. Great. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Our next question is from Key Ben Kim with Truist Securities. Please proceed with your questions. Thanks, Don. Good morning. Um, quick question on ECRIs. Uh, as you look ahead, are you projecting to be a bit more aggressive in terms of magnitude or frequency with your ECRI program compared to 2023? So, Keith, we spoke about this a little earlier. There's a little bit of a give and take uh, this year. We're expecting that uh, on the one side, the consumer remains strong, as Joe highlighted in his remarks, uh, and that we don't see a significant shift in customer price sensitivity, uh, which you know, we've been very encouraged in experiencing through 22 and 23. So that's one side. On the, the other side, on replacement costs, move-in rents are still down 10 11%. So replacement cost is higher at the start of this year than it was at the start of last year on average. And so that's going to have a, a detriment to overall contribution. Uh, but the flip side of that uh, that I highlighted earlier was the fact that uh, we moved in a lot more new customers uh, last year. Move-in rents were strong, up about 9%. And that will have a positive impact on uh, the, the, the mag uh, not the magnitude, but the, the number of increases that we send throughout the year. And those things largely will offset such that the contribution of ECRIs as we sit here today in the midpoint case is pretty consistent year over year. Okay. And I, I'm not sure how you internally gauged this, but uh, can you provide any color on changes that you notice on your customer conversion rate um, or your market share win of customers? Yeah, so Joe spoke to a lot of the tools that we were using through last year, advertising, promotions, rental rates, and, and the power of, of our advertising platform online. So we saw better than industry top of funnel demand into our system, which ultimately led to good move-ins. But we also saw stronger conversion associated with both 
uh, pricing and promotion, which are more conversion-related items, uh, such that conversion rates uh, both through well through all the channels that that we uh, that we operate in, both uh, website, call center, and, and folks walking in, are higher uh, in 23 compared to 22, uh, and we're seeing good trends into 24 as well. And yeah, on top of that, Keben, you know, as we've talked about, our digital platform continues to give customers the ability to again transact with us, you know, through not only digital platform, but um, you know, now even through our care center, et cetera. So we're making that that conversion activity even that much more effective relative to um, again consumer intent. Um, with all the tools that we have to get them, you know, to the top of funnel activity, but then actually to the conversion itself um, from a speed, efficiency, time of day. Um, you know, frankly, many of our customers transact with us in off business hours now. So um, all, all very good tools that continue to lead to a very strong conversion that, to Tom's point, we feel like we've got good industry-leading capabilities that we're going to continue to invest and optimize going forward. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next question comes from Hong Hang with JP Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, hey guys. Uh, I guess first off, I'm glad you fared much better in SoCal because it definitely felt a little bit more in Northern California. But uh, I guess I guess my first question is just: yeah, is it is it safe to think about the low end of the range as basically there being no return, no um, seasonal demand, or are you expecting higher seasonal demand compared to last year, even at the low end? Uh, we're, we're assuming less seasonal demand in the low end. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, I think that's something I mentioned earlier. So uh, agree with that, and more seasonal demand uh, in the high end. Uh, okay. And then um, I guess my second question, uh, you've grown your management platform pretty well. Have you had any success in sourcing acquisitions from there yet? And how big of a potential source of, that, of acquisitions do you think that could represent in the future? Yeah, that's a key component of the growth of the platform itself. You know, it's a very relationship-oriented business. Um, thus far, we've acquired close to 40 assets out of the program. Um, over the last um, few quarters, it's been on the light side. Again, it's, um, I think, indicative of the environment that we've been seeing in acquisitions in general with many owners not um, of a mindset that this is the right time necessarily to do a transaction or a trade. But with the growing platform itself, uh, again, we saw very good traction in 2023. We've got you know good momentum going into this year as well. Those additive relationships, knowledge of the assets, uh, their comfort level with our own ability to transact very efficiently will continue to be a good source of not only relationships but um, acquisition activity over time. So I noted that you know now the program's uh, at about 325 assets, and uh, we still see good momentum to continue to grow um, to our ultimate goal and optimization of the platform. Um, so we'll likely see that in the next year to two, um, and with that, more acquisition opportunities. No, thank you. Our next question is from Eric Lubchow with Wells Fargo. Please proceed with your question. Uh, great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the spread between move-in and move-out rents. I assume that gap should start to narrow by mid-year just based on the move-in rent improvement you talked about, but should we expect any change in the average rents of customers moving out based on average length of stay or any other variables that, that we should consider there. You know, Eric, sounds like you have a pretty good handle on that. It, we're sitting here in the winter, Q4 and Q1. Uh, you're going to have that differential between move-ins and move-outs be higher. Uh, that's going to then narrow as we move into Q2 and Q3 uh, and then rewiden again uh, in the fourth quarter. Uh, obviously, the comments that I made around move-in rents uh, getting to a point where they're not declining on a year-over-year -year basis through the fourth quarter will be helpful on that, but you're still probably going to end uh, in a similar territory on, on gap there between move-in and move-outs in the midpoint case, uh, and we're very comfortable with that um, and, and managing uh, to achieve those higher revenues from our in-place customers who are placing a lot of value on, on our space. 
Great, thank you. And just my follow-up, um, you touched on this several times, but the newer customers you've loaded at much lower move-in rates the past year, uh, you talked about increasing the frequency and the magnitude of, of rate increases for that cohort. So have you seen those large rate increases kind of perform within expectations um, as you've started to push those through kind of toward the end of 23 and early 2024 in terms of either retention or customer receptivity? Yeah, I'd say that uh, reiterate something that Joe mentioned earlier, which is that the uh, customers continue to behave as expected and uh, with some strength, uh, and and we continue to see good good momentum within that program, uh, and that includes both newer customers as well as uh, longer term customers in the program. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question is from Ronald Camden with Morgan Stanley. Please proceed with your question. Uh, the first is just on the same store revenue guidance with flat. I guess I'm trying to tie your comments about a first half and second half dynamic where the first half maybe is a little bit slower and you have a pickup in the second half. So should we be bracing for sort of negative same store as you start the year before you end the year somewhere sort of well above zero um, uh, uh, to get to the midpoint of the guidance? Yeah, that, that's a good question, Ron. I, I hope that everyone's not bracing, uh, but I would anticipate that we see deceleration through the first part of the year, and yes, that uh, likely in, uh, involves a negative performance on a year-over-year -year basis through the first half, and then yes, reacceleration as those uh, the lag between operating metric improvement and financial metric performance starts to show uh, in the second half of the year. Great. And then, look, my second question is just, I guess we're trying to figure out how aggressive or conservative uh, the guidance is. Because on the one hand, you talked about, you know, last year there were a lot more macro concerns, so maybe that was a reason to be a little bit more conservative versus this year. But you also sort of mentioned that the move-in volumes, you know, at 9% was basically 2x what you did in, 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 in sort of uh, 2022, which should presumably set up well for pricing power. So maybe could you, uh, when you're putting all that together, uh, maybe can you talk about how much conservatism or not is built into the guidance this year and how we think about that? Sure. So um, I, I guess the way I'd couch it is we did uh, cover a macro uh, series of scenarios uh, for our guidance ranges last year. The range on same store revenue was about 250 basis points. Uh, this year, as we sit here, there, there's still uncertainty, uh, as I highlighted, maybe a little bit less than what we experienced last year, what we were expecting last year. Uh, and so the range is 200 basis points this year, so not too far different. Our core FFO range uh, was about 70 cents last year. I think the range this year is 60 cents. So we're still talking about similar levels of, of range. And as a reminder, we operate a month-to-month -month lease business. Uh, and, and so there, there is some variability that could play out through the year. I've tried to be very transparent on what the, the range of potential outcomes are on a number of the key metrics, both at the high and the low end. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll look on executing uh, through our plan this year, and uh, I'll leave judging conservatism or aggressiveness uh, to the investment community, but we want to try to be transparent around what our assumptions are and, uh, and how we plan on navigating through the year. Thanks so much. Our next question is from Steve Asakwa with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. Just one quick follow-up, Tom. It sounds like your um, contractual rent you know, for move-ins will still be negative in the first half of the year. I think you said it was running down about 11 in the first quarter. I think you said you expect that to get to about a break-even in the third quarter. Um, but I guess what is the overall expectation for the year? I mean, I presume fourth quarter might be up fourth quarter over fourth quarter, but that still leaves you kind of negative for the year. Is that kind of the right way to think about it? Yep, that's the right way to think about it, uh, Steve. The midpoint case, I think uh, move-in rents are down 3% uh, on average through the year. Great. Thanks. That's it. Our next question is from Michael Goldsmith with UBS. Please proceed with your question.
to just one one quick follow up for me. Um, you know, I, I think you know from our conversation with investors, I think they were expecting same store revenue growth at kind of like the low end of your same of your same store revenue guidance. So, what do you need to see uh, or believe about the consumer or the the length of stay to get ECRIs to drive kind of that same store revenue growth at that low end of the guidance, all else being equal. And I, I know it's kind of like there's a lot of moving parts there, but just what would need to get the ECRIs to the low, to the low end of the same store revenue guidance? Well, I would it's not just with, ECRIs, yeah. right? I mean, we, we gave you a, a lot of different metrics at the low end that get you get you there. Um, you know, I, I gave you the perspective that demand, new customer demand in that lower end case doesn't stabilize till uh, the, the, uh, later in the year, and you don't cross year over year move in rents until the fourth quarter, um, really towards the end of the year. Um, ECRIs, we're assuming in that case that there's a little bit more price sensitivity than what we're experiencing right now um, uh, to directly answer your question. Um, move out churn, uh, we're anticipating really in, in, uh, is centered around in the midpoint case the same levels of churn we saw last year, which is very consistent with what we saw in 2019. Churn levels are up a little bit in that low end case, but but not materially. Um, so that, that's what gets you, gets you there to the... Uh, get you there to the low end. Thank you. And then again, Michael, as you know, we've been speaking to, you know, we're 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 seeing again continued validation of a um I would say healthy economy, very consumer oriented economy where um the pressure points of a year ago or beyond relative to whether it was inflation, um interest rates, um employment, et cetera, um, are at a better place today with more clarity today than they were certainly at the beginning of 2023. That continues to play through relative to our own month-by-month -month operating metrics that we're seeing going even into 2024. So um, something would have to shift pretty materially away from that to give us a different low-end view um, as well. Yeah, and we'll obviously update you on that as we go through the year. I'd maybe reiterate something I said in my prepared remarks uh, that I would focus more on move-in rents. That has been the big area of variability over the last year or two on same-store revenue performance. I tried to give uh, the investment community some guideposts in terms of how we think about that going through the year. Uh, but we operate a month-to-month -month lease business where we're going to be uh, adding about 6 to 8% of our tenant base every month. And the rate with which we uh, add those customers is going to be uh, very impactful on where we end up through this range. Um, and um, you know, we'll update you on what we're seeing on operating trends as we move through the year. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. We have reached the end of the question and answer session. I'd now like to turn the call back over to Ryan Burke for closing comments. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. We'll uh, talk to you soon. Take care.